the recover guidelines um, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about what recover is. The first thing I want to do is just define a few things here. Um, you probably already know the definition to these words, but um, CPA or cardiopulmonary arrest, um, that is considered the complete cessation of effective circulation or ventilation. Um, I do like to specify effective because um, a lot of our patients um, maybe have like a little flutter of a heartbeat or maybe they are agonal breathing, um, but neither of those things are an effective way of circulating or ventilating. Um, so oftentimes, um, if you feel a little flutter or you feel like they're in distress, um, that is right them right on the cusp of um, having a CPA. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation itself um, is sometimes called um, CPCR. We just kind of throw the cerebral resuscitation in there too. Um, the definition of that is the act of using ex external mechanical means or chest compressions to restore adequate heart, lung, and brain blood flow and oxygenation to allow return to spontaneous and sustained cardiopulmonary function with consequent recovery. So that's our, always our goal when we are doing CPR. Um, through a lot of this lecture, you'll hear me say ROS or ROSC, and that's just return of spontaneous circulation. So the Recover Initiative um, is a program that was, or an organization rather, that was established in 2012 by several veterinary criticalists. Um, Recover stands for the Reassessment Campaign on Veterinary Resuscitation. And the title pretty much says it all. Um, basically, these doctors got together and they were kind of comparing the survival to discharge rate for human medicine to um, our sad 6% survival to recovery or survival to discharge rate um, in veterinary medicine and wondering why we can't get closer to that 20% that they have in human medicine. And they started collecting data and basically putting together um, guidelines for CPR. Um, we didn't have that before in veterinary medicine, so that was huge to have those guidelines um, and kind of give us an industry standard for CPR protocols. They also have the only official veterinary CPR certification, um, which I highly recommend, and I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the lecture. Um, they do continuously collect data from hospitals. Um, you can use a recover CPR form and submit data on what you're doing in your code, what your results are, and they will actually use that to continue to build on these guidelines and hopefully make them better um, as we learn more about CPR. Okay, so one of the things that I kind of want to clarify with the Recovery Initiative is how they differentiate between basic and advanced life support. Um, this chart to the right here is their CPR algorithm. It's probably something that you've seen. Um, we here at IndyVet have this hanging in our treatment room right by um, our crash cart where we most commonly do CPR. Uh, and their basic versus advanced is a little bit different than what I understood them to be. Um, so basic life support is considered just the chest compressions and ventilation of a patient. Um, moving on to advanced life support, that is monitoring the patient with an EKG, pulse ox, capnography, whatever it is that you have available, um, getting vascular access, and then administering emergency drugs like atropine and epinephrine. Um, I always considered advanced life support to be open chest compressions. Um, that is something that is suggested if you have done 10 minutes of CPR with external compressions with no return of spontaneous circulation. Um, open chest compressions are much more effective, but once you get the patient back, if you do get the patient back, you're now dealing with a non-sterile um, thoracotomy site. So there's a big risk with that. Um, and it's not something that we really would routinely offer here at IndyVet, um, but it is something we would do um, if we had a patient code in surgery because we already have typically the chest or abdomen open. 
and that would actually be the easiest way for us to perform chest compressions um, through cardiac massage. So that's just a little clarification on that, and we'll kind of break this down as we go through. So our areas of focus are going to be preparedness and prevention, basic life support, advanced life support, monitoring, post-arrest care, and then we're also going to squeeze in some triage in there um, at the beginning. So as far as preparedness and prevention, um, staff training is a huge part of that, making sure that you have established CPR protocols in your hospital um, and that you're kind of updating those um, at least yearly. Um, at Indy that we do twice a year CPR training for all of our staff members. Um, and that works out really well for us, but I know sometimes there's not always time for that. Um, but providing that hands-on training can be really helpful, especially um, to people just coming out of school. We talked about CPR in school, but we didn't even have like a, a dummy to practice on. So actually being able to do that hands-on and have somebody instructing you when you don't have a patient there that you're trying to save is really helpful. Another way to be prepared is just to have a well-stocked crash cart, um, have it centrally located or um, like one of those big carts on wheels that you can relocate easily and take it to the patient. Um, and that should be stocked after every code um, and it should be checked morning and night um, just to make sure that it's fully stocked and ready to go when you need it. Some things that are super helpful to have on a crash cart are oxygen supply, anything you might need to intubate, catheters, blood collection materials, um, any emergency meds that you want to keep there, so atropine, epinephrine are probably the most common ones, um, as well as syringes and flush fluids. Um, suction can be very helpful, um, especially when you're trying to intubate. And some people will even keep um, like a synthesis pack or a, um, like a trait kit there, just so that they have everything readily available if they need it. And lastly, the CPR record, um, just so you have someone recording when you started, um, what medications were given, when the catheter was placed, um, all of those details that will need to go in the medical record after the code. And another really good tool is using um, post-code discussion. So just spending a few minutes after a code to talk about maybe what could, what could have been a little bit better, um, what you did well. And it's really important not only to have this conversation, but to have it um, in a healthy way. So we're not pointing fingers and saying, oh, you couldn't even get a catheter in this patient, or oh, you should have done better compressions or whatever it may be. Um, talking about how we can do better the next time is the more productive way to talk about that. And I think that that can be really helpful um, to continue to build and be better at CPR. Okay, so moving on to triaging. Um, some of these things are gonna seem a little bit obvious. Um, if you have a patient that's not conscious, um, if it's not breathing, um, if it's apneic, or if it's agonal or having trouble breathing, um, or if it doesn't have a very good pulse or you can't find a pulse. Um, if your answer to any of these questions is no, or if you're not sure, you should probably start chest compressions. Um, respiratory distress is the most common type of arrest that we have in veterinary medicine. So if you have a patient that's really struggling to breathe, um, whether it be dyspneic or on the verge of being agonal, um, those are the ones that are just on the cusp of um, coding. So if you're unsure about any of these things, just start compressions. If you're doing chest compressions on a live patient, they're going to let you know really quickly. So uh, you really can't do any harm in starting compressions um, or life-saving measures um, just to be sure that you're not missing anything on that patient. This is just a nice little chart that our ER director put together. These are sort of common um, presenting issues or just quick assessments that you can make um, that should indicate to you that this patient requires immediate intervention. So any of these things, uh, respiratory distress, if maybe there's abnormally noisy, 
noisy breathing, if they look blue or maybe what we would call like a little dusty, so they're pink but not super pink. Um, moving on to the cardiovascular system, if they're pale, if they have abnormal CRT, heart rate, pulses, um, cold extremities, if they seem mentally inappropriate, if they are having a seizure or have had a seizure, um, even urinary things, so like a blocked cat um, or anything that you suspected may have ingested a toxin or um, a hyperthermic patient, like a heat stroke patient, all of these things are um, indicators that your patient is at high risk to code and needs not only quick intervention, but then continuous monitoring because they're just at a very uh, tedious place where a uh, CPA would not be completely unheard of. So just making sure that you're vigilant and prepared for that is going to be really important with any of these presenting issues. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to basic life support. Um, previously, people were always taught to just follow their ABCs. So if you had a CPA, you would establish an airway, you would breathe for the patient, and then you would work on circulation by implementing chest compressions. Um, this is really not suggested anymore. If you had a situation where you were a single rescuer, so if, if you were maybe instructing an owner on how to do CPR on a patient or on a pet that they found at home um, unconscious until they could get them to the hospital, then you would suggest that they follow ABCs. Um, but really, we're primarily going to do CABs. So we're gonna start with circulation or our compressions. Um, we're going to establish an airway by intubating, and then we're going to breathe for the patient. Um, this is more effective, not just in witness CPAs, but also in CPAs of cardiac origin. So that is the most common CPA that we'll have. And, um, CABS is just the recommended um, way to do CPR. We will talk a little bit more later about um, instructing owners on mouth to snout ventilation and compressions if they are the only person available to resuscitate a patient. So chest compressions, um, I'm gonna show you this little video here before I start talking about them. Hopefully it works. So you can see in the video, um, this person's keeping their arms straight and it's hard to see because you can't see their shoulders, but um, keeping your arms straight, your fingers interlocked and your shoulders sort of centered over your hands um, is the most effective way to get a good compression without really wearing yourself out. So uh, by doing this, you use more of your core muscles rather than trying to bend your elbows and use your arms. Everybody has a little bit different way of holding their hands, whether it be just laying them over each other or interlocking your fingers. Either of those are perfectly fine. Whatever you're most comfortable with is best. Um, the most important thing is just that your arms are straight and you're centered over the patient. Your compression should be about 30 to 50% of the chest width. So I'm just gonna play this again so we can see that. Um, you just want to make sure that when you compress, you're compressing um, pretty substantially to get that 30 to 50% compression. Um, and you do still want to completely recoil between compressions. Um, you don't just kind of want to mush, mush, mush. You want to mush, release. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important. When we do chest compressions, we do two minute uninterrupted cycles. And then we switch we switch people. Um, if you're just like really tough and think you can do more than two minutes, that's great. But the longer you do compressions, the less effective you are at them. So we are always really um, strict about switching at two minutes because nobody wants to say, hey, I have to stop, I'm tired. But it is really important that you're comfortable doing that because we wanna make sure that our compressions are good and effective. Um, and then when we switch people, we want to be pretty quick about that. Um, only five to seven seconds between compressions. Um, that's a really good time to listen for a heartbeat and just keep an eye on your EKG and see if you see any activity there. Um, but you really don't want to go more than that. That should be a really quick transition to the next compressor. 
when we're doing compressions, we should try to stick around like 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Um, if you need to have somebody tap their foot or play another one bites the dust for you, um, whatever works um, to stay in that range, um, whatever works for you is best. Um, and the reason for that is um, it's people are more inclined to go really fast with compressions rather than doing a adequate compression. They'll just do lots of compressions. And if you get a compression of 150 compressions per minute, you're actually decreasing the effectiveness. You're not allowing enough um, time for the chambers of the heart to refill. So you're really not circulating blood around as much as you like. Um, so trying to stick to that 100 to 120 is best. And if you're doing an adequate compression um, and you have capnography av available to you, you should get like 15 to 20 millimeters of mercury on your entitled CO2 reading. Um, and that indicates to you that you are effectively compressing and recoiling and allowing that blood to circulate throughout the chest. There are um, two techniques um, for chest compressions. Most commonly, we're gonna do the thoracic pump technique. That's suggested for most medium and large dogs. Um, most of the time they're in lateral recumbency, but if you have a bulldog or any sort of barrel chested dog, um, they do better if you put them on their back just because they're so round. Um, you still compress over the widest part of their chest, just like you would if the patient was on their side but now you're just doing the compression on their sternum. And the point of this thoracic pump technique is that when you compress, you're increasing that intrathoracic pressure and you're displacing that blood out of the major vessels and into systemic circulation. And then when you recoil, it creates a negative pressure and it kind of pulls all that blood back into the heart and thoracic vessels. And you're basically just um, circulating with external means. So that's why it's so important to have that recoil and create that negative pressure to pull everything back in. So hopefully you can reoxygenate it and send it back out with your next compression. For smaller patients or maybe oddly shaped patients, we use the cardiac pump technique. Um, rather than being over the widest part of the chest, um, we actually want to go directly over the heart with this technique. So they are typically still in lateral recumbency. We're just aiming right over the heart. Um, so you can see in this top picture on this kitty, um, that's one way to do it is to wrap your hands around. Some people also kind of just use one hand and just cup underneath, whatever's most comfortable for you works, as long as you're just right over the heart with your compression. This is also, um, a little bit easier and better for these dogs like greyhounds that have kind of a really deep and narrow chest because if we try to go at the widest part of their chest um, their heart kind of sits all the way down at the bottom and we're probably not really going to be compressing the heart at all so doing your compression directly over the heart on these guys is best too um, it can be a little bit difficult I think it's easiest if you kind of brace them and brace their back against your knees so they're not sliding around too much because they're just so wedge shaped and narrow at the bottom part of their chest um, that there's going to be a lot of moving around. So bracing them against you um, helps me out a lot. And again, with this technique, you do still want that recoil. So if you're using your hand to compress on a small patient, just make sure that you are um, kind of releasing your hands and allowing that, um, that recoil in between compressions. Okay, uh, once we've started compressions, the next thing we need to focus on is intubation, which can be pretty difficult um, for several reasons. Um, most of us learn to intubate when a patient is sternal and we can kind of say, lift the head, put the head this way, do this for us, hold the tongue out. But in this scenario, a lot of times they're in lateral recumbency and somebody's already doing compression, which is making your patient kind of jostle around. So it can be really difficult to visualize. And you just wanna make sure you're using all your resources, um, a laryngoscope, a flashlight, whatever you need to use, 
um, so that you can see what you're doing. If you need to suction, um, that's why that's really nice to have the suction on your crash cart um, so you can clear the airway out and really visualize well. And a few other tips, um, if you're really having a hard time, whether it be it's just difficult to see or maybe this patient has some sort of occlusion in the back of their mouth, um, using a red rubber catheter to just get that down there and provide some oxygen while you continue intubation attempts um, at least gives them some oxygen. Um, if you have a smaller ET tube, sometimes you can kind of use that red rubber to um, just kind of slip it inside your endotracheal tube and use that as a guide. Um, so that can be helpful if you're just having trouble um, getting a tube in. Um, if there's no way to intubate and at this point you're just kind of desperate to provide oxygen, um, you can use a IV catheter and just um, insert that between the rings of the trachea. Once you're through the skin, you can remove the stylet and just slide the catheter in and those will actually hook up to a three or three and a half um, the end of the ET tube, and you can provide oxygen that way while you try to continue intubating. If you have tried to intubate and you're just really having a hard time, whether it be visualizing um, or whatever, that's a really good time to get a doctor and start talking about an emergency tracheostomy um, because if you're already doing compressions and you can't intubate, um, at some point, there's not going to be any oxygen circulating in that blood that you're compressing. So um, it's pretty vital at that point that you get oxygen in some way. Um, once you are intubated, just making sure that you can visualize or palpate um, or use your cabinography to make sure your endotracheal tube is in place um, is ideal. You don't want to get five minutes into compressions and realize that um, you're actually inflating the stomach. So just taking a second to palpate, making sure you're in the right place is really important. Once we are intubated, we can start ventilating for a patient. Um, and this is another area where it seems kind of counterintuitive, but we actually don't want to breathe too frequently or give too large of a breath for a patient. Um, so we want to stick around like 10 to 12 breaths per minute. When you're giving a breath, you don't want to go all the way up to that 20 centimeters of water that we would normally do if a patient was under anesthesia. You want to stick around 10 to 12. And the reason why we do that is because if you give a really big breath like that, um, the lungs are taking up space where blood could be circulating. So it actually increases the pressure on um, the right atrium, on your pulmonary artery, on the vena cava, and it actually decreases your cardiac output. So you really want to stick in that 10 to 12 range so that we're not pushing too much blood out of that area. Um, and that's another thing that's just kind of hard to do um, because you're stressed and you know your patient's not doing well. So just making sure that you're taking a beat, focusing on your breaths, and keeping an eye on your manometer so that you're not going over that 10 to 12 is, is best. If you were in a situation where you're not able to intubate a patient, or maybe you're instructing an owner on CPR, um, mouth to snout is the, pretty much the only other option you have, unless you happen to have an AMV bag. Um, and to do this, it's just how it sounds. You're just going to kind of use your hands to um, kind of hold the mouth closed, and you're going to breathe right into their nose. Um, if you're doing this and you're also doing compressions, you want to do a 2 to 30 ratio. So you're going to give two breaths, you're going to stop, give 30 compressions, and you're going to give two breaths and then restart your compressions. So typically we wouldn't really do this in hospital because we are able to intubate and provide oxygen and all of that. Um, but if you were off-site or, again, helping an owner, this is um, what I would suggest for ventilation. Okay, so that's basic life support, just basically just compression and ventilation. So now we're going to move on to advanced life support. Um, at this point, our patient should be intubated. We should be um, well into compressions and considering giving emergency drugs. 
So we need high IV catheter, which again is very difficult because our patient doesn't have any circulation. Um, and also there's a lot of, there's a lot going on. The patient may be being moved or moving around a little bit just from compressions. So um, ideally we would get a large bore IV catheter in. Um, that's the best way to flush a lot of fluids and give drugs, but any catheter is better than no catheter. So if you're unable to get just the biggest catheter that you can in, just put whatever size is available. Um, if you need to just put a 22 in a giant dog, that's fine. We can work on getting a bigger catheter later, hopefully when our patient is doing better. Um, but don't get too hung up on the large bore um, catheter. Um, if you are having a lot of trouble, there are some other options for vascular access. So in this top picture, um, you can see this person performed a cut down. So basically they just um, used a scalpel to make an incision through the skin and that allows them to visualize the vein and just put the catheter directly in it. Um, that's really helpful if your patient is vasoconstricted or just doesn't have good circulation. And then we don't use this a ton in bigger patients. It's mostly neonates, but this bottom picture is of an IO or intraosseous catheter in a neonate. Um, those guys are just so tiny that it's very hard to get a catheter in even when they're healthy. So if they're doing poorly, um, if they have coded or um, are about to code, it's almost impossible to get vascular access. So don't forget that IOs are um, an option for you. They seem kind of gnarly and scary, but once you do it a few times, it's really not that bad. Um, and these little guys, we usually use like a 22 gauge catheter in their femur. Um, and you're able to just kind of rotate that until you get through the bone and then you can flush drugs there. Um, if neither of those are an option, but you do have the patient intubated, um, don't forget that you can put your emergency drugs down in the tracheal tube. You do have to use quite a bit more, um, and um, usually we multiply our volume by 10 when we give it down the endotracheal tube. Um, and then you just wanna give a breath after you give it to flush that in. Uh, we don't wanna be flushing like a ton of um, flush down the endotracheal tube and into the lungs. So using a breath to do that is best. Um, and then don't forget, um, in these patients that um, have coded or are on the verge of coding. Um, if we're giving emergency drugs and they have poor circulation, those drugs are not going to get into the system um, like, like they normally would if the patient was circulating well. So just make sure you're using a lot of flush after that. So if you have a cat or a small dog and you're giving medication in the cephalic vein, you're gonna to wanna to flush like 10 to 12 mils of saline after you give your drugs. And it's gonna be double that if you're using a lateral saphenous or a medial saphenous vein. And then for medium to large dogs, it's even more, it's 30 to 40 mils if you're using cephalic and then double that for a lateral or medial saphenous. Um, if you are giving fluids during a code, that is fine. Just make sure that you're using it to flush those through adequately or they're just not going to get into circulation like we need them to. Okay, so typically the drugs that we give during a code are atropine and epinephrine. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about why we use those and what they do. Um, atropine is an anticholinergic. We do sometimes use it as a pre-med if we have a patient that's bradycardic or um, sometimes neonates will have um, atropine given as a pre-med prior to anesthesia. Um, and Basically, the reason why we do that is because it increases their heart rate and it also decreases secretions in the airway. While this is a drug that's really commonly used as an emergency drug in CPAs, it's actually been shown that there's no harm or benefit to giving it during a CPA. So some doctors will actually omit this from their CPR protocol. Um, but if you are giving it, usually the protocol that we go with is every two minute cycle, we would give a dose of atropine. So um, if you just started compressions, you've been doing compressions for two minutes, 
when you switch to the next compressor, that's when you give the atropine. And then on your next compressor, you would give epinephrine. So we're rotating back and forth between those. So we're actually going to give them about every three to four minutes, if that makes sense. Um, in addition to some doctors not using atropine at all, um, some will give only two doses of atropine because it does have a longer duration of action than um, like epinephrine. Um, it's really not necessary to give more than two doses during a, C a CPA. So it may only be used for the first two or three rounds of compressions. Um, the dose that we typically use for that is 0.04 mg per kg and preferably you would give it IV. Um, epinephrine um, is something that really is only used in emergency situations and may not be as well known. Um, it's an alpha and beta adrenergic agonist. And like I said, we primarily use that for cardiac resuscitation, but it may also be used if a patient was having an anaphylactic reaction. Um, it causes vasoconstriction and it increases blood flow to the heart, which is why it's very helpful during a CPA. Um, but it does have some pretty nasty negative side effects. Um, it increases the amount of oxygen that the heart needs, um, the heart muscle needs to function, which is not ideal if we're in a CPA situation. Um, it can also result in arrhythmias, but um, the big benefit of that is that we're, we're getting the vasoconstriction and that's really helping with our circulation when we're trying to get um, spontaneous return back. Um, that is given IV again every other two minute cycle. We typically start out with the low dose, which is 0.01 mg per kg IV. Um, and then after two doses, if we've not seen um, a return of circulation, we increase that to 0.1 mg per kg IV. Um, that is another thing that can be a little bit doctor dependent, um, but the recover guidelines are to start low dose for two cycles and then go up to the high dose. You don't the effect that you want. This is the chart um, that was put together by Recover Initiative. Um, it's super helpful because across the top, you can just sort of guesstimate the weight of the patient if you don't have it. And it gives you the volume that you need to give. So it kind of takes the math out of things when you're in a stressful situation. It also has, um, your reversals down here towards the bottom. So if you have a patient that's coded under anesthesia or under sedation, or maybe was given medication like an opioid or benzo that could be counterproductive when you're trying to um, resuscitate them, don't forget that all of those reversals are options and should be given in a CPA situation. Um, just keep in mind when those medications were given and if these are going to be helpful, um, but don't forget that they are there for you. Okay, so the second part of advanced life support um, is monitoring. I think most commonly we rely on pulse when we're trying to um, check for return of circulation, um, but it's really not super reliable, again, because your patient's moving around a lot. It may be hard to feel. You may have a patient that's very over-conditioned um, and it's just hard to feel no matter what. Um, we check it anyway um, because it's easy. It doesn't cost us anything. It doesn't require any equipment, um, but it's not always the most reliable mode of monitoring. A Doppler can be helpful, um, but again, if we don't have a pulse, then um, it's very difficult to use the Doppler. Um, you can use it on the eye. You just lubricate your crystal and put it on the eye. Um, you can hear a pulse there, but it can be misinterpreted. You'll just hear kind of the back flow of your compressions. So um, it's really only helpful in between cycles when you're switching compressors, um, but it is another tool you can use. Probably the best piece of, piece of equipment for monitoring during a CPA is your EKG. Um, if you have a return of a heartbeat, um, you'll see it there first, probably. Um, it is also very helpful if you get a heartbeat back that you have an arrhythmia. Um, you can diagnose that quickly and treat it. Um, and 
this is that this is what we use during that five to seven seconds when we're switching compressors to really see if um, our efforts have been successful and it's our best indicator of return of spontaneous circulation. Another tool that is very, very helpful um, is your entitled CO2. Um, so hopefully you have capnography available to you um, and definitely use it during, during your CPRs. Not only does it show that you're doing effective compressions, um, but if you have a rapid rise in entitled CO2 while you're doing CPR, that is a really good indicator that you have return of spontaneous circulation. So keeping an eye on that in your EKG is probably your best bet in monitoring. And also, if you get your patient back, continuing to monitor these two things are going to be really helpful to recognize if your patient is on the verge of coding again. Okay, the last little bit of advanced life support that we're going to go over is the defibrillator. Um, I know that Gray's Anatomy has made the defibrillator seem like really cool and like we use it in every code, but there really aren't a ton of scenarios in veterinary medicine where we would need to use the defibrillator, um, mostly because you need a functional pacemaker in your heart for the defibrillator to work. So there are only a few um, arrest arrhythmias here that would actually um, benefit from the defibrillator. So if we have asystole, we have no function um, of the heart. That's just a complete flat line, no electro electrical activity. So using the defibrillator would not be effective. Um, same with pulseless electrical activity. Um, there may be ele electrical activity in the heart, but it's not organized and it's not effectively um, communicating through the heart muscle. So that's another scenario where the defibrillator wouldn't really be helpful. Um, sinus bradycardia is just another scenario where you have a functional pacemaker, but for whatever reason, it's not working well, whether it be sick sinus syndrome um, or what have you. But again, the defibrillator is not going to help you out. It will help you out if you have ventricular fibrillations or pulseless ventricular tachycardia. Um, you can see in this little chart here, it shows you um, kind of a rough example of what these would look like. So those are the only two scenarios in veterinary medicine where you would really use the defibrillator. Um, so if you identify those, um, using the defibrillator or precordial thump if you don't have it can be helpful. Um, the precordial thump is just a thump, you basically just make a fist and you do one hard thump on the widest part of the chest. Um, there's not a lot of evidence that it's helpful, but it can um, reverse VFib if you didn't have a defibrillator available to you. Uh, in the recovered chart, it does have a section that tells you by the size of your patient um, what charge level you want your defibrillator at. It's typically two to four joules when we're doing external defibrillation. So I'm gonna show you, um, this is the defibrillator we have here at IndyVet. And it's really nice because it's very straightforward. Um, you can see the top right of the unit, it has a button next to one, two, and three. And it's basically just step-by-step -step how to turn it on, set your joules, and then charge it. Um, so it's super simple and straightforward. It even has an EKG um, internally, so you can use that and monitor when you defibrillate your patient. So the process for that would be just to turn it on, um, figure out how many joules you want. You want to apply um, electro gel to the paddles or to the patient. And um, we put one of the paddles on the sternum, one of the paddles on the apex of the chest. You do want to um, yell clear before you put the paddles on the patient. Um, and in response, everybody around the code table should lift their hand and say clear back to you. Um, that's just indicating that they did hear you. They're not touching the patient. They're not touching the metal table that the patient is on. And then you're able to press those two little red buttons at the top of your paddles 
and that will discharge your defibrillator. Um, if, again, if you don't have a defibrillator, that's fine. We don't use this super commonly, but um, there are scenarios where it can be very helpful. Okay, so post arrest monitoring. So at this point, we performed CPR, we got our patient back, but oftentimes when we get a patient back after a CPA, they're in worse shape than they were before they coded. They still have all their pre existing issues um, and whatever it was that caused them to go into a CPA in the first place. So it is really crucial that we continue to monitor them and try to prevent them from coding again, because again, that's very common. Um, and we can do this just by continuing to monitor their, monitor their EKG, their entitled CO2. Um, a pulse ox can be helpful, uh, monitoring blood pressure and temperature, and then trying to um, resolve any issues that we can. So if they, if they are hypothermic, providing heat support to them. I think it's always a good idea to provide oxygen to any patient that's in a frail state like this. Um, and then most importantly, we need to identify why they coded and try to treat that if we can um, as quickly as possible before they code again. Um, and then just being attentive and making sure that we're looking for signs that our patient is starting to do poorly again, or maybe kind of backpedal a little bit. A few common complications um, after CPR or to CPR is multi-organ failure, um, cardiogenic shock, and cerebral hypoxia. So um, just keeping a really close eye on these guys, um, really intensive monitoring um, is crucial to making sure that we get that um, recovery to discharge. This is also a really good time to revisit their CPR status with the owner. Um, oftentimes, if a patient has coded and we got them back, um, but they're still doing poorly, the owner will opt to not resuscitate in the event of another CPA. So just making sure that you're on the same page with the owner at this point um, is a good idea, in my opinion. Um, all of this information um, I got from Recovery Initiative. Um, so you can go to recoveryinitiative.org. Um, they do have really good programs for basic and advanced life support training. Um, it's just really good information, even if you're not in a situation where you're doing CPR super often, um, it's still just really good um, review of the anatomy of the heart um, and kind of why we use these techniques. Um, they also have a CPR trainer certification. So if you are interested in continuing education with your practice um, and kind of taking the lead on um, that preparation and preparedness so that you can train new hires on CPR and keep everybody kind of up to date on new guidelines, um, this CPR training certification is really great. Um, I think that's all that I have. Yes, that is all that I have. So Mariah, if we have any questions that have popped up, um, I'm happy to go over those now. Um, as of right now, I don't um, have any questions, but if anybody wanted to write anything now, or they can always um, just email um, Lauren at her um, Gmail account and she can answer those questions for you if you don't want to um, ask any right now. Um, we'll wait just a couple minutes to see if we get any questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, I am just going to scroll back to this too. If anybody wants to jot that down at recoverinitiative.org, um, even if you don't sign up for one of the training programs, um, their site is just very helpful. They have good information there. Um, you can find all of those charts with the um, emergency drugs, as well as that flow chart of basic and advanced life support if you want to just have those um, for your hospital use. All right, does anybody else have any questions? If not, um, we're gonna end this and then definitely feel free to send Lauren an email or um, you can always call IndyVet too.
Um, if you have any questions, let us know. Thanks. Thank you.